The three witnesses, please open your Bibles to 1 John chapter five, because we will be more or less staying in that text for our, for our lesson. I think that if I ask people, the people gathered here, a question, raise your hand, you know, if you wanted to be resurrected from the dead and go to heaven, don't have to raise your hand, but I suspect that if I asked that question, you know, pretty much everybody would raise their hand. Yeah, who, want, who doesn't want to go to heaven? Of course, I want to go to heaven. And if I asked each one of you, how was this going to happen? Most would explain in one way or another that Jesus would do this because of our faith in Him. That's kind of a general answer to that, but yeah, that's how we're going to go to heaven. And then if I asked you uh, why you believe this to be true, or to give me a reason to believe that what He promised was actually true, some might have difficulty answering this particular question. Some might say, well, I've always believed this. This is what I've been taught. Or others might say, I don't know why, I just believe it. I just do. And still others might say, well, the Bible says so and that's enough for me. Well, there may be sincere answers. These may be sincere answers, but they're not quite enough to answer a skeptic on why you believe what you believe. For this reason, I want to take a look at 1 John chapter 5 today, and I want to examine how John supports the belief that eternal life comes through Jesus Christ as surely as the rain falls from the sky. John's approach to answering any doubts about the Christian's reward is to provide three witnesses who testify that what Jesus said, and especially what he said about eternal life, was indeed true. That's why we call it the three witnesses in 1 John chapter five. Now, the concept of witnesses confirming the veracity of some event is an ancient idea. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 17, it says, on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death he shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. The hand of the witnesses shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people, so shall you purge the evil from your midst. So you notice here in a judicial sense that this same idea continues to be true today. If you have one eyewitness, well, you've got a good case against someone. If you have two eyewitnesses, it's a lock. If you have three witnesses, it's almost insurmountable. When Jesus used the same standard when instructing his disciples on settling disputes over offenses against one another. He's the one who said, but if he does not listen to you, take one or two uh, with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact can be confirmed. And so John, uh, in his first epistle, also uses the idea of witnesses to confirm the fact that Christians have a sure hope of eternal life. You get, the, you get the concept? If we need three witnesses to convict someone of a crime, John says, well, I'll give you three witnesses to convict you of the truth that you're going to heaven, that you're going to have eternal life as a Christian. And so in verse five, he says, who is the one who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is uh, the Son of God? And so the question is, who overcomes the world? Who is the one that does that? In other words, who overcomes what is in the world and what happens to the world, mainly sin and death? That's what happens in the world. This is what is in the world and what is inevitably happening to everything in the world. You grow, you die. That's what goes on in the world. He asks if there is anyone who can overcome these things. Have we ever heard of anyone who has overcome these things? 
And then he answers his own question by saying that only the one who believes in Jesus overcomes the world and those things. Now the term believes that Jesus is the Son of God, that term compresses everything that goes along with that, that we repent and are baptized as an expression of faith, that we live faithfully as Christians as an expression of faith, that we persevere in our faith until death as an expression of faith. He kind of takes all of these ideas and just compresses it down to those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. In other words, only the Christian overcomes the world, meaning overcomes the sin and the death that is in the world. Then in verse six, he says, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the spirit who testifies because the spirit is the truth. You read that and you go, huh? <laughs> I kind of understand all the words, but what exactly is he saying? Well, John wrote this letter to respond to certain heresies of that time, which proposed the idea that Jesus was just an ordinary man who possessed the spirit of God, but only for a short time. They promoted the idea that the divine spirit first entered Jesus at his baptism by John, but left him before his death on the cross. Now this false teaching turned Jesus into a prophet, right? Because like prophets before him, he had the spirit for a time like Isaiah and uh, robbed him and his sacrifice on the cross of its power to atone for sins because you know, the spirit of the divine God left him before he died. That was, the, that was the danger of this heresy. So John, as an eyewitness of Jesus' life, reminds them that Jesus had the full credentials of the divine Messiah. At his baptism, that's the water, the Father in heaven declared in an audible way that Jesus was his beloved Son, Matthew 3, 17. And then at the cross, that's the blood, Jesus reaffirms, uh, excuse me, John reaffirms that Jesus made the sacrifice needed to atone for sin. You see, only a perfect life offered by a divine being has the power to remove all sin from all men for all time. And this is what John is getting to here. In verse seven, he says, for there are three that testify. So John declares to the heretics that the truth of these things does not rest solely on his eyewitness testimony, but what he teaches stems from the Holy Spirit himself. Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to guide the apostles into all the truth. John chapter 16, verse 13. And part of that was to correctly remember and interpret the events surrounding Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection and his ascension. And so when John is speaking, it is like the Holy Spirit who speaks through him. In verse eight, he says, the spirit and the water and the blood and the three are in agreement. And so John now brings together the three witnesses that attest to the truth of the original statement concerning those who believe in Jesus. The first witness is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit witnesses for Christ in many ways. The prophets that the Holy Spirit inspired to speak of the coming and the ministry of Jesus for over a period of 1400 years. And then you have the more than 300 prophecies given by the Holy Spirit through various prophets that were fulfilled by Jesus. Then you have the spirit by his power, uh, uh, raising Jesus from the dead. Romans chapter eight, verse 11. That's another way that the spirit testifies or is a witness. And then through his guidance, 
the apostles and the disciples saw Jesus alive. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse one. And of course, the spirit guided the apostles in their writings about Christ and his resurrection. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, uh, Peter said, men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And so John is saying, this is how the Holy Spirit is a witness through the, through the prophets, through the prophecies, through the power in resurrecting Jesus from the dead, uh, through the guidance of the apostles to uh, uh, record uh, the inspired writings. This is how the Holy Spirit is a witness. So the Holy Spirit testifies in many different ways to bring us the word which teaches us about the divinity and the work of Jesus Christ. And then he talks about the second witness, the water. The water of course refers to baptism, the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. Now some think that it refers to the water that the baby is immersed in within the mother's womb. I often hear people argue that, you know, when you argue, whenever they're talking about the water, you know, you must be born again through the, the spirit in the water, they think, oh, that's not baptism, that's the water inside the mother's uh, womb, you know, when the baby uh, is being carried. Uh, others think that uh, it's the water that came from the side of Jesus when he was pierced by the soldier on the cross, you know, in John chapter 19. A any excuse to uh, deny that the water in the Bible is always referring to baptism. So those are a couple of the excuses that are used. Well, it's not the embryonic fluid because it does not relate to anything else in the Bible. Nothing else in the Bible refers to that. So it's not that, that's for sure. And it's not the water from the side of Jesus because the order is wrong. In John 19, 34, John says the blood and the water. In 1 John 5, 8, it's the water and the blood. Also the water from his body was a sign of death, not a sign of life. And the water at baptism is a sign of life and renewal. And it is the same order that his life took. First there was the baptism, the water, and then there was the blood, his death. That's the proper order of the, of the witnessing. And so the water is a witness because God uh, covered his baptism with many signs of his special status. The appearance of the dove to signify his anointing with this in a special way uh, by God. The hearing of God's voice, acknowledging his unique position with God as the beloved son. God himself testifies that Jesus is the chosen savior. If God says Jesus is divine and that his work is blessed, then we have pretty strong evidence that it is so. And so the water refers to his baptism and all the signs that accompanied it, as well as his command to his disciples to go out and make other disciples. How? By baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is how the water testifies, through the baptism, through the dove, through the voice, and then through the command to go out and baptize uh, all people uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. And then the third witness is the blood. The blood is the suffering and the death on the cross. It is a witness in several ways. The Old Testament prophets, for example, said that the Messiah would suffer and die for others' sin. Isaiah 53, four and five, for example. The way he suffered and died and all he said and did at the time revealed him to be uh, the Messiah. And the fact that he rose again from the dead on the cross is the strongest evidence that he is indeed the divine Messiah and the divine son of God. We read about that in Romans chapter one, verse four. It's important to have this witness because many came and many have come since that time declaring that they were the Messiah or they are the Messiah but only the true Messiah has the witness of the spirit, the water and the blood. And so the writer closes the verse 
with the comment that the testimony of these three witnesses do not conflict. All three are saying the exact same thing about Jesus, that He is the divine Messiah. Now, in a court of law, three corroborating witnesses create a basis for believing that something is true beyond doubt, beyond a reasonable doubt. In Jewish numerology, the number three represented God, divinity. The number four represented the earth, north, south, east, west, the number four. The number six represented imperfection and the number seven represented God and his creation together. And so what John is implying here is that with these three witnesses, the Holy Spirit, the water and the blood, you have a witness equal to God himself giving testimony. And then in verse nine we read, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his son. And so John refers to the readers again by saying that if they can believe the witness of weak men teaching false things, surely it shouldn't be a stretch to believe what God has even bothered to do. And that is bear witness for his own son. It should be obvious, but God testifies anyways. And then in verse 10, he says, the one who believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And so here John describes the, the good and the bad consequences of not believing such a powerful witness. The good is this, the one who believes the testimony receives the witness into himself. If he believes what he receives is the baptism and the blood and the Holy Spirit. The witnesses continue to testify, but this time within him in order to maintain his faith. You know what Paul says in Romans 8, the Holy Spirit within us cries, Abba, Father, to uh, demonstrate that we are sincerely the children of God. And so the one who believes also grows to believe other things revealed to him by the Holy Spirit in the word. Now, there are also bad consequences, he mentions, for those who disbelieve. The one who disbelieves the witnesses make them out to be liars. You reject the witness, you reject the son, you reject the son, you reject the father. You reject the father, you suffer the consequences. And so in verse 11 and 12, it says, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. How much clearer can this be? How great a judgment we face if we read these words and reject them. Because of their clarity, there's no ambiguity here in verse 12. He who has the Son has the life. Which life? The eternal life. And he who does not have the son of God does not have the life. Which life does he not have? The eternal life. And so John reviews the promise once again. Those who believe the witnesses receive the gift of eternal life. And those who do not believe forfeit the eternal life that they could have had. With this, uh, unequivocal statement, John rests his case concerning belief in Jesus as the Son of God. In many ways, we today face the same kind of challenge to our faith in Jesus Christ. Within Christianity itself, there are those who are trying to cast doubt on the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Imagine that, I, I get it that you know, guys who don't believe come up with all kinds of reasons not to believe but people who actually claim that they're Christians 
are working overtime to deny that Jesus is the Son of God. Within our own faith, we have people who disbelieve the divinity of, of Christ. In the world, there is a constant attack from every quarter challenging the teachings of the Bible and specifically the claims of Jesus Christ. These modern day heretics and disbelievers offer uh, modern theology or evolutionary theories or scientific snobbism as their case against uh, Jesus Christ. We, on the other hand, remain with the three witnesses and the decision that faces every generation. We are the jury and we can either, first of all, we can disbelieve the witnesses we then dismiss their evidence and reach the same conclusion that the Jews arrived at, that Jesus is not God to this day for the Jews, he is not God. We then have to look elsewhere for our salvation, for our answers and for our God. Or we can be a hung jury. We continue to doubt and delay and put off a decision. In this case, we remain deadlocked we're dead spiritually and locked into this world and its outcome. Or we can believe the three witnesses. If we believe the water, the blood, and the word of the spirit, then we must act. Believe that Jesus is the son of God and acknowledge this. You acknowledge this by repenting of your sins and being immersed in the waters of baptism for forgiveness of those sins and then be ready to live eternally with God in heaven when Jesus uh, returns. And so what will your verdict be? If you've had to make this decision for the first time today, then believe the witnesses and come for baptism. If you've wavered in your faith and need to be renewed, confirm your decision by coming uh, for prayer. And if you need the ministry of the church at this time, or would like to identify with this congregation to serve this community, we also encourage you to make that known as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement. Shall we do that now, please? <laughs> 